I'll crack on. Um, so the, the title of my presentation is the Tango Problem Formulation, the Patient Researcher's Reflection on an Action Design Journey. So my name is Michael Toomey. I'm um, a PhD candidate uh, in UCC in Cork University Business School. And um, thankfully, and uh, after three years, I've been um, coming towards the end of my PhD now. So the angle that I'm coming at today is to kind of tell you, I suppose, the problem that I've encountered within my own life. It's a real world problem and how I used action design research to remedy or, uh, I suppose, ameliorate the problem in hand. But the, the angle I'm going to take is, I suppose, the lessons learned in terms of one of the key parts of action design research, which is problem formulation and the struggles that I had and um, and I suppose what I've learned in relation to problem formulation that uh, is directly related to, I suppose, I, all types of practitioners, but um, particularly my focus was around action design research. So the, the challenge, or I suppose the research motivation was how might we augment um, how might we augment cystic fibrosis patient care and memory recall or information retrieval within the elicitation and elucidation phases of the medical appointment? Now, the relevance of this to me is I have cystic fibrosis myself, um, so I have a direct, it directly impacts me. Um, and obviously, I'm involved in the community as well. Um, I would uh, be involved in cystic fibrosis Ireland. So I'm, I suppose, 48 now, and I decided to take the plunge to do a PhD because I wanted to, I suppose, give something back to the community, but I also wanted to resolve this problem that I encounter frequently when attending medical appointments. Um, the, I suppose the problem being recalling medical history, which is in the elicitation phase, whereby the doctor asks you about your medical history um, in order for the doctor to arrive at a proper diagnosis, which obviously affects the treatments you're put on, etc. The elucidation phase then is when the doctor has made a diagnosis and discusses and explains the various treatments, options, etc. Um, um, and the various ways to, I suppose, take treatments, etc. But therein lies the problem and people often take their memory for granted. But as everyone that is listening, you know, we as humans, you know, we have limited capacities cognitively and we do forget, okay? Um, within the medical appointment, uh, because it can be very often stressful in nature, um, it leads to, I suppose, an increase in this um, memory recall or information retrieval problem, um, where basically the, the literature shows that memory is, is often flawed, incomplete and erroneous in relation to medical um, uh, recall of medical history. Right? Moreover, 40 to, 40 to 80 percent of, of information um, discussed within a medical appointment is almost forgotten immediately. So, um, the medical history in itself is made up of several different, uh, I suppose, components, illnesses, symptoms, medical appointments, therapies, medications, etc. You know, um, and so what I decided to do was create a checklist, right? Now, I will discuss later what I first uh, endeavoured to do. But nevertheless, the, the final artifact that I arrived at in my action design research journey, which is practice inspired research. And um, therefore, as Paddy was saying earlier, it's the combination of design and action where I was deeply in the swamp, so to speak, of trying to solve this problem. So um, Atul Gwande was one of the first people to actually, I suppose, use checklists within a medical context um, to solve I suppose, memory recall problems within the um, surgical environment and found it very, very beneficial. He discovered it from, I suppose, where it first came about was in relation to the aviation industry. Um, flying B-52 bombers was so complex that there were several aspects of the flight, um, I suppose, process that were being forgotten. And so they made a checklist. Atal Gwande uh, took that learning and applied it within the surgical um, arena and I decided to take that learning and apply it and develop it within the medical appointment arena to see if we might um, you know solve or ameliorate or at least help the, the patients. Um, so the checklist um, then evolved from that um, within this booklet 
and I'll explain the reason of that happened later. Um, but I suppose to date, the contributions I'm in relation to this have been an 81% of participants re re reported an increase in their ability to remember the medical history. Um, 72% um, basically gave a four out of five in relation to it reducing the stress within the appointment environment, right? And 83% felt more empowered um, um, within the, our, from using the artifact itself within the, within the real world appointment setting. Um, clinicians, this is a senior clinical uh, psychologist in, in Galway University Hospital, also found that it was that it was something they were looking for to help their patients and carers deal with the stressful situation that they were encountering within the medical appointment. So thus far, I suppose this is one of the big impacts from a practical perspective. The, the checklist has been distributed by CF Ireland to every patient or carer within Ireland, and it's also been distributed to all those countries in the map as well for, for consideration and evaluation. Um, as a result of that, the NHS um, the hospitals in the NHS have now started distributing it to their patients as well um, for use within the medical appointment. Um, so it has been very impactful and, you know, looking at it at first glance, one would say, you know, it's very, very simple. And that is, you know, the essence of, it, of why it's worked so well. Um, so looking back, I suppose, which is, I suppose, the topic of a of a, 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 a journal of medical internet research publication that's coming out and um, actually has been approved and it's been published within the next few weeks, is this whole concept of reflection and looking back um, at my research over the last three years and what really resonated, what real problems, you know, did I encounter and um, what was it like? And that's what I'd really like to share with you today in relation to, you know, action design research you know, which is, an, which is iterative in nature, it's practice inspired. Um, and we have this whole concept of problem formulation. And for me, I felt that I was like an awful lot of other researchers that I really felt that I had understood the problem at hand very, very quickly. Whereas in actual fact, from, you know, experience, that was not the case. Even though I'm a person of 48 years of age, now a patient attending medical appointments on a frequent basis, Nevertheless, I did not understand what the real problem was. You know, this is not to say that our focus is always on just the problem. Problems and solutions co-evolve. And this is why you have this image here of the two dancers doing the tango. Problem and solution co-evolve. Nevertheless, what I seem to, what I experienced myself and seem to see in our and research is that the focus seems to be more on the solution with an almost, um, you know, expectation that we understand the problem um, you know, and we can proceed on with the solution um, and, and almost you know, with the problem solved in terms of understanding what the problem is in and, in and of itself. So what are the problems with problems? Um, from the research that I looked at, you know, there, this is um, a growing area and has been around for some while, but nevertheless, if you look at one of them, in real life, there is a, not a single static, well-defined problem, but a constantly changing problem. So problems are constantly evolving, and that is the case as well in relation to the medical appointment. Another one, human biases fixed on these unwarranted assumptions and the fixation interferes with the insight needed to solve the problem. There's no doubt about it. In my research at the very, very start, I was thought I understood the problem and I was fixated on creating an app, an app to try and ameliorate this, this problem that we experienced within the medical appointment. Um, People often are too quick to evaluate stages of problem solving rather than gaining complete understanding of the problem. So it's this concept of understanding the problem, right? And understanding it from different perspectives, etc. You know, so basically this is an image here, which I think encapsulates my journey quite well. It's only by going through the various cycles or iterations of this agile process of action design research that we can very often um, increase or augment our understanding of the actual problem in the first instance. And it's a journey and it happens over time. And as we go through each iteration, we should go back to the problem formulation stage <clears throat> and see, is our understanding of the problem still accurate? Has it evolved? And indeed we should expect it to evolve. 
So this is kind of a, I suppose, a brief synopsis in the paper that uh, is coming out in the JMIR. I basically used um, O'Driscoll's model of, um, of reflection through a series of vignettes. So V stands for vignette here. But in my first vignette, when I started um, this journey, I was convinced that uh, the problem was that, pa that there was no current patient electronic medical record system that caters for the needs of CF patients or carers, right? Um, this evolved to when I started using and, and developing the uh, um, checklist um, in the form of a paper-based preter type um, to actually, it wasn't so much that they, you know, the patients weren't talking about um, not having an app. They were talking about their information, the inability to remember, the inability to have it with them when they traveled on holidays or when they in, in, encountered new clinicians, etc. You know, so we created the the um, the checklist, and it was very very impactful. But I was trying to understand then why is it being so impactful? You know, do we really understand what's going on within the context of of, of the checklist? And um, from there, the in vignette three, we actually kind of pivoted our understanding to it's not actually being information needs. It's actually memory recall is the problem, you know, their inability to recall and the various influencers that affect memory recall within the medical process, be it health literacy, be it forgetting, or be it emotional state. Um, and then I wasn't satisfied with that um, either. And I said, do you know, I'm going to go away and do a fairly comprehensive lit review, which was systematic in nature, which is another paper that's actually been published quite shortly. And um, it was basically, I discovered that one of the reasons that the medical, um, the checklist was working as well, if that, if we uncoupled the um, memory recall into its components, right, we discovered that in actual fact, uh, that the, the checklist, by studying the narratives within the medical appointment, that the checklist um, actually maps the various types of and memory components, declarative long-term memory components, I should say, um, onto the checklist. And this is the reason it was working so well. So it was satisfying the various types of um, subcomponents of long-term declarative memory um, that were used with, by the patient. These would be episodic memory, which would be you know, a particular event, autobiographical memory, which is the culmination of events, our medical appointments over a length of time or over the individual's lifetime. And prospective memory would be another example, remembering to remember, remembering to report symptoms at the medical appointment, remembering to ask um, questions. So my lessons learned um, is number one, problem formulation requires a conscientious focus on co problem comprehension, avoiding solution fixation and other assumptions. Problem formulation requires, this is lesson two, in-depth human, human centric exploration, scrutinizing a problem thoroughly through the senses of those experiencing it, understanding how it affects them, culminating in the articulation of an accurate problem definition. Lesson three, in the problem stage of ADR, we must challenge ourselves to look at a problem from different perspectives, from alternative disciplines, if we haven't found or considered alternative viewpoints, we may fail to understand a problem well enough, affecting the most appropriate articulation of the definition of the problem. And we must be willing to go deeper into the problem formulation stage of ADR to help explain observed phenomena, highlight shortcomings, uh, shortcomings, which in the case of my checklist, it was originally just a page. I hadn't converted it into the booklet. Therefore, I hadn't really ticked the box in terms of autobiographical memory or capturing um, um, a number of appointments over a period of time. Um, enriching problem definitions, resulting in a truly comprehensive understanding of a problem domain. So I encapsulate that in a model, um, which is one of the contributions, whereby we see that you have this, um, the, you have it overlaid my kind of, or my journey over the various stages of action design research, problem formulation, build intervention, evaluation, reflection and learning. But you can see there that as the vignettes 
or my story evolves over time, the, the learnings also evolved um, all together leading to impactful outcomes. So that's it um, for me, folks. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Well done, Mike. So we've about four, four minutes, so plenty of time for a few questions. So some of the comments here, Mike, so fantastic global uh, contribution, uh, well done. And you know, also, um, uh, and I think that the impact has been massive when you see it even mapped across the, uh, the, the globe. Um, a question from Anthony, you know, um, is there an opportunity for looking at, uh, sorry, just skipped away from me there. Um, uh, is there an opportunity for looking at the potential of life logging tools and wearables to help record the information so you don't have to remember it's recorded automatically? Uh, and also, did you look at the international use of PHRs, patient health records? I did. And the funny thing is within the medical appointment, and we actually started with a kind of a digital intervention in the form of a simple spreadsheet and, and, and an iPad. And we did some kind of workshops and, and I suppose testings. And what we found was that using, as technology currently stands, using a digital or a tablet or an, an app or um, a mobile phone within the appointment actually detracts from the communication within the medical appointment. Um, they're finding that in actual fact, uh, the same thing is happening with doctors who are using electronic and medical records within the States, that their time is more focused on entering data into their PCs, et cetera, than it is interacting with the, with the patient. So this was one of the drivers that we had that for the checklist was that we discovered that the, the digital um, uh, artifact may actually and was um, interfering with the discourse between the clinician and the patient or carer. So the, the nice thing about having something paper is you can be scratching away. It's not requiring you know, the same level of cognitive, um, I suppose, demands. There's not this fiddling around with, with technology, which can, as I said, detract. So nevertheless, there's no doubt about it. There is an environment outside of the medical appointment that still needs to be explored because 99% of a patient's life is outside of the medical appointment. And therefore, next steps would be seeing how we might, you know, translate what we've learned within the paper-based artifact into a digital. How can we, should we? Are there technologies that we may use, um, such as voice? You know, what are the challenges there in relation to possibly using voice? Like my vision is that we would have a solution that would eventually um, eliminate silos of data that would give an accurate representation in real time of the, of the patient, right? But also give an accurate representation of a, co of a cohort of patients. We refer to it as the herd and gain real insights through data analysis. And that's one of the limitations of the checklist in its current form. Because it's paperless, you can't analyze the data unless you get the data and input it somewhere else. So there are challenges, there are limitations with the checklist, which I'm experiencing on a daily basis. Hence, I've taken the step now, even though I'm doing a PhD to develop um, an application to try and remedy some of the deficiencies within the paper-based checklist. And so, so some very nice comments here that are worth looking at afterwards, Mike. A lot of people uh, calling you to continue with the research and uh, to continue making the impact uh, you're, you're making. Really nice question here from Mark as well, saying how easy was it to, uh, I suppose, introduce the autoethnographic element into your research? Again, a lot of research doesn't allow the I or the me to be um, front and central. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I suppose there was... Uh, it's, and it's a paper I'm going to write about later, is that being so close to something that's so personal in nature, um, on the one sense, it was very, very motivating and inspiring. And, you know, it was, um, but on the other hand, it was challenging the sense of having to manage emotions. And I really need to, needed to learn quite quickly to, I uh, suppose, compartmentalize my mental thoughts and really focus on what I wanted to do and who I was doing it for. So there were challenges there, and um, no doubt. Nevertheless, because of the fact I was a patient, the, the narratives I was having, discussions I was having with patients and carers, there was a lot of obstacles removed very, very quickly. Um, 
and it allowed us to get down to the brass tacks and, and deep into the problem easier than it might be for others who are not familiar with the environment or the problem that, that, I, that we're experiencing. I also learned actually, which is quite interesting, is that you know, just because we tag someone as having the same condition, you know, which is quite common within the clinical profession where they say, oh, he's a CF patient. Um, nevertheless, one has to appreciate that we're all humans with different journeys, with different stories to be told. And that's why human-centric design is so important. We need to gather those stories and understand it on an individual basis to be able to translate it into the solutions. So for me, action design research was a wonderful methodology because it's practice inspired, you're deep within the swamp. Nevertheless, I found the deficiency within it is that, you know, it doesn't tell you the, the how of problem formulation. And for me, the design thinking, which is human centric in nature and um, was fundamental to my research from that perspective. Yeah, good man, Mike. Um, and Owen sending uh, again um, uh, good wishes, you know, and um, uh, I suppose just uh, commenting very positively on, on the research. A lot of uh, questions coming in. Austin, good wishes again. Mary, maybe ask a few questions. So, Mike, there's a few questions maybe uh, if you want on, on the chat there, if you want to get back to people again, if you want to share any of your uh, details. Um, uh, and it's absolutely fantastic to see the checklist the, um, I suppose, the brochure or, 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 or the handbook might make its way around the globe. And it's a real uh, testament to your um, uh, tenacity, uh, you know, in terms of, of this uh, uh, research, but also the value of your research. So well done. 